Okay, so it's 12, uh, it's five after, so we can go ahead and get started if you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. So we'll be doing the regular format, uh, names, pronouns, and the icebreaker question. Um, our icebreaker for today will be, uh, I realize I've never asked this question, but we are a book club, so I'm curious. Uh, do you have any book club, any book tropes you love or hate? Um, so I will go ahead and go first. Uh, my name is Jonathan, pronouns he, him. Uh, any book club tropes I hate? I have to say uh, enemies to lovers. I think that trope is just so overdone. Um, and especially when we, when I see it in queer media, it's always bully and like bullied is how they express the enemies to lovers trope. And uh, I just think it's predictable and boring. Um, I don't think I have any that I love, but yeah. What about you? Um, my name is Michael, he him pronouns. Uh, this is a good a good question. You're putting me <laughs> putting me on the spot. Um, I do. Oh, there's like a name for this. I should know this from like tenth grade English class. When there's just like some like magical solution that comes in like towards oh, the end. Wow. Is it a uh, uh, date ex, ex machina? That's what I was. Okay, so that, that's what I was thinking. But I'm glad. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> I like a little bit of a love hate relationship with that one, but I don't, I don't like when it is like not, not believable or like not not pulled off in a way that uh, I think like really, really lends itself to the story. Um, I do. I I feel like that can be uh, sort of like the enemies to lovers, a little a little overdone sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. That's yeah, definitely a good uh, good thinker. When I saw that question, I realized I don't even know which ones I hated, but the more I thought I can with that answer. Okay, so um, what did you think of The Year of Blue Water by Yin Yi? Um, I thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. It was not as easy for me to digest or make sense of like I'd like to, um, mm -hmm. as much as a lot of the other stuff that we've read um but it was a quick read i did like that um but i did have to read it more than once and still don't think that i like get some of it but um i don't know what about you jonathan what did you what did you think of this one yeah i i agree um it was confusing at first i read it I want to say like two or three times. Uh, like I mentioned in book club and uh, Discord, uh, the first poem I read that like six times, and I wasn't really sure where it was going, and I never really made sense of it. Um, I guess putting it in the frame of it's just an amalgamation of the author's dreams. I guess it doesn't have to make sense, but just from a reader's perspective, I found it unsatisfying. Um, also, I'll say I thought it was interesting reading uh, the Year of Blue Water right after reading Homie. Um, the writing style is very different. And I think that Homie, not to talk about that book too much again, but I think that Homie uh, has more of a, more of a traditional uh, poetry book format. Whereas this book to me seemed more like a diary. It didn't really seem like I was reading poetry. Um, and I think one of the main examples of that, like I mentioned in Discord, was that none of the poems have names. Um, did you pick uh, up on that while you're reading it? One of them, two of them have names, right? Yeah, I, that's what I was thinking. You know, but only, I think, only the only those two. I think that might be like uh, perhaps like naming the sections. I don't necessarily know if those are like oh. names of the poem because I originally did think like you that it was meant to be a poem name. So when I read the first poem, Dream Diary, I kept reading until I got to pomegranates, thinking it was a one long poem. And then I realized, I think they're meant to be broken up. Um, but yeah, I don't yeah, know, maybe you're right. I wouldn't, I only thought of Dream Diary as its own thing because I watched the video you sent of mm -hmm. uh, you reading the poem before before I actually read it. So I was like, mm -hmm. oh, that's like, that's one poem. But the video did not help me at all. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, I, I did appreciate um you know, hearing, hearing, and seeing the author uh, really actually actually read the poem, but I was like, "This 
it was read the same way I read it with a lot of question marks in it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess I'll ask, uh, are there any poem, any poems or entries in the book that stood out to you the most that you want to discuss first, or do you just kind of want to go in a bit of an order? Um, I made notes on some of them, but I think we mm-hmm. can go in order. Um, okay. And maybe I like, I think the first one is a good place to start. Yeah. I'm curious, um, ta- talking about the first one, do you think there is a reason that one comes before anything else in the book? And then I, of course, have the same question about the very last one. Um, but do you, I I was kind of thinking, like, as, as I reflect and I, I read through it again, that maybe, maybe the dream diaries at the beginning to sort of make sense of some of that other stuff, not not always being like really i don't i don't want to say not being cohesive but um maybe just being a little a little whimsical in the way that it is it just yeah just a little whimsical in the way that it is i don't even want to say in the way that's organized um but mm. did you did you get like any sort of similar similar thought i know you said you read it a couple of times as well yeah i would definitely say that i did Uh, I think it was whimsical, just that that was the intro of the book. I didn't really get a sense as a reasoning. Um, I don't know, because, I mean, if I'm thinking about the collection as a whole, I don't think it really gave me a good sense of what the book would become, or I guess where the book would go, memoir I read. I think that oftentimes the first entry in a poetry book or first chapter in a book, whatever, um, is kind of meant to... Uh, to like set the tone. I don't think that that poem really did that, at least for me. Um, So I don't really get why it went first. I don't know. Yeah, I don't don't really either. The only thing I could think is that like, maybe it's trying to set up that like, you know, like here, here at the beginning, I'm like establishing like, this is, this is a dream. It doesn't, it doesn't Mm -hmm. necessarily make sense. And that we're supposed to keep that in mind as we go through the Mm -hmm. rest of it. But and I guess now that you say that, I'm thinking in some ways it does give us an inclination that the book, is, the book is going to be a mix of reality and like dreams. So I guess yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, after reading the whole collection, did you get any sense of reasoning as to why the author named it the year Blue Water? Um, no, and actually I didn't even think about the title. <laughs> and I'm not sure why, because it is a really, it seems like, I mean, it is a very intentional choice for a title that doesn't, to me, seem to mesh with anything in here. I don't even think, does the word water show up anywhere in the book? I don't believe so, or if it is, it's not the focal point of any one of the poems. Yeah. Yeah, I, no, go ahead. No, I mean, like, the only thing that I that I think of thinking that is like some sort of like long, like a long, long voyage at sea or long, mm-hmm. long voyage without any sort of like home, which does, does fit with a lot of what's going on in what's in the book. But that is a like off the, off the cuff, um, you put me on the <laughs> spot and I want to, I want to assign meaning to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like you, I didn't, really get it at all myself um i thought perhaps blue i know that in art the color blue uh or the tone blue is often depicting sadness and i can understand the term blue water because i would say that the collection as a whole is quite sad we're dealing with a lot of death a lot of uh suicidal ideation a lot of anxieties abuse uh so i get the the word blue in that sense but the year of blue water didn't make sense to me. Um, But I do have a quote from the author where he explains the title. Um, He says that, um, I had this interest in forever as a time, which is why it's called the year of blue water. Most of the writing for this book was done within one year. Pure water has a slight blue color and smaller quantities, it looks almost see-through. But the more layers, the bluer the water looks. Does that clear up the title for you? Um. I think so. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think that after hearing him say that the book was written in a year, that also for me makes it feel like a diary. Um, because I feel like oftentimes the poems just seemed like streams of consciousness, not really uh, a poem written with like a direct point or that it's meant to go a certain place for a reader. Yeah. And that takes me to uh, to poem five, which is another poem that kind of stood out to me. Uh, the, po the author says that uh, anxiety makes him feel like solitude is unbearable. Um, I'm curious, for you, when you experience anxiety or think of anxiety, do you, does it make you want to be in solitude or want to be with people? Um, definitely more in solitude, um, which is direct opposite of what maybe the author is saying that he wants here. Um, mm -hmm. It's funny though that you jumped to this one because I have no post-it note on this one, but I have post-it notes on <laughs> like every every poem around this one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing about this book as well is uh, a lot of the poems didn't stick out to me, but like a few did. So if you have any before this, and we can talk about those first, but this is just the next one after the first one that jumped out to me. Yeah, I did. Um, just quickly on two, I just like was questioning as I read it to myself, like, is this supposed to be a collection of letters the second time I was reading through it? Um, but I'm I'm not sure. And if it was, and that sort of made me think, I mean, again, not to discuss the the last poetry book too much, but it made me think about the last one a little bit because I definitely got, you know, that that in some sense from the last one. Um, and I did think about code switching for number three. That's all I read on my poster was code switching. Um, and in number four, because this came up a few other times uh, with other poems in the book, but I just, as I was reading through that one, it made me think about how sometimes like with mantras or meaningful art or, um, you know, really, really any experience, we remember what's important or what sticks out to us and that. Um, we don't always have like a perfect recollection, and I think we see that in a few, a few other places. But mm. that's those are my notes for two, three, and four. I don't have any notes on that, so I, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> so I guess I can't comment too much. But I do understand what you're saying about poem two, and I'm glancing back over it. Um, hmm. I guess now that we're looking at it, oh yeah, you did say, you mentioned code switching in poem three. Uh, yeah, I agree. Looking back over it, the three different versions of yourself and having to decide which one to bring to each setting. Yeah, that all makes sense. Very, very, very queer, very POC thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I guess now that you mentioned it's a very POC thing, there's another poem in here. Let me see which one it is. Oh, before I go past, I guess I should say that with poem five, um, yeah, I agree. Uh, so anxiety always makes me want solitude. Uh, so I thought it was interesting that the author pointed out that it makes him want to be around people. But the author also does say that his home is decorated with things that remind him of his family and loved ones. Um, and being around them alone makes him think of them dying. And I know that like fear of losing people is a very serious anxiety for some people. Um, yeah, that was interesting. You. That makes me think. Um, if you if you don't mind skipping around, just because mm -hmm. you mentioned that, yeah, there's sure. a poem. Um, where is it? Where he's dreaming about his says in all my dreams, either I die or my parents die. There it is. Uh, oh, it's pomegranates. Mm -hmm. Um, but just just sort of going going off what you just said that sort of I don't know maybe maybe this is tied into the anxiety piece a little bit but as I read um pomegranates or poem 20 I'm not sure um I also noticed this is one of the few that had like what seemed to be intentional formatting with the lines mm -hmm. um, but it made me think a little bit about like coming out like knowing that um you know that it may it may pain like the people around you or uh you know for for 
depending on where you're coming from, like maybe kill kill a little piece of them and that you have to be either okay with that or okay with your, you know, with continuing to like let that little piece of you um, die inside. Um, which kind of you know, seems, seems to tie in with five, or at least I want it to, because mm. I had a specific note about that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think that that is intentional. I mean, the author does uh, put in one of the lines, in my dreams, I'm still their child. I'm not a ghost. And I know that in another one of the poems, I'm honestly not sure which one, uh, the author says that when he told his mother that he was trans, uh, she took it as her daughter dying. Um, and I know that is a very common perception of uh mm-hmm. Of, of that a lot of parents have when their children come out as trans, they think of it as their like biological child dying, as opposed to their child is changing. Do you um, remember the poem about the shoes? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Is that is that the one you're you're referring to? But I don't it, I don't know if it. Hmm. I think it's. Is, but it sort of like filled or fits into that same, um, that same thing. Hmm. I don't think it's that one. It could be. It's one, I believe it's the one where Yin Yi talks about uh, his mother consistently calling him. And every time she does, it's like she just kind of dumps all of her emotional issues onto him. Um, this is where I think she says, my daughter is dead. issue with, I guess, having a PDF copy is, I'm sure my page numbers and yours are very different. So I would ask you for a page number, but they're probably different. Oh, um, I, I kind of think they're the same. I looked at the PDF a little bit. Was it 20, it's 26 in the hard oh. copy. The shoes one is at least. I'm looking for the other one, but I don't. I might have that. Well, I can't find it, but I you could be right. I'm not sure, but I don't I don't know. I don't I don't think it is as I'm reading back over it. It doesn't say anything about dying in here. Hmm. But yeah, just to go back to your original point, I do I do think you're right that uh that that line does connect into uh poem five. And they are connected. Another common thing I noticed in the book is that uh Yin Yi has a few poems where he doesn't name a specific person, but he says she a lot. Uh, did you notice that when reading a few of those poems? Uh, I I think I caught it once or twice, but I don't know every single time. Like I'm seeing on page 30 is one of them. Uh, like I know, for example, the shoe poem is, is, I think the first time I noticed that was the shoe poem. Oh, does it not say? I believe he just keeps saying she. Oh, yeah, no, you're right. Wow. And I just, I just automatically wrote in his mother, but um, it doesn't mm-hmm. ever explicitly say that that's who it is. Yeah, that was my next question, actually, was did you believe it was his mother? Uh, originally, honestly, I thought it was a female friend, um, but... After having read it a few times, there is a line where Yin Yi says, um, I came out to her 10 years before. Um, and I think the context of 10 years, considering that Yin Yi, I believe in that poem, is around 20, 22 or so, um, would have to be an adult, not another child. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that made it she. But there is another poem where Yin Yi, it's later in the book, I'm not sure which one, discusses being in a domestic, uh, possibly so that, domestically. Hmm, that ahead. is the very next one after after the shoe poem where, where it's just the shoe. On mine, on mine, it's on, well, not like the very next one, but the next one where it says only the shoe. It's on page 30 in my hard copy, at least. But it's funny because that's actually the one I was going to ask if you thought the same thing reading the shoe poem and reading this one. Mm-hmm. Because it makes it makes me think it's not always the same she. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. As I think that might have been a relationship. Uh, I mean, I know that Yin Yi does discuss 
his parents seemed to be violent towards each other, at least when he was young. Um, but he never mentions in that poem his mother hitting him. So it does seem like, yeah, that must have been a relationship. And then in that same poem, he says, when she kissed me, it was as hard as, it was just as hard and just as long. When did I become repulsive? Yeah, I think that's a relationship, I believe. Yeah. And I guess on the topic of this poem, the author talks about his body, which takes me to a poem earlier in the story, which is poem six. It's uh, right after the anxiety poem. Uh, mm -hmm. He says that as a trans person, it's never been that he's hated his body. It's more that he's never had an interest in it, um, which I guess I also thought was interesting. I mean, as a cis person, I wouldn't have the same thoughts as he does. But for me, my body insecurities have never come from a place of not understanding it, more so a place of like a hyper fixation on it um, and like wanting to change it. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, did that poem spark any things for you, any questions for you, or did you relate to it at all? Um, I don't, I mean, I actually had some kind of similar thoughts to what you mentioned, is that, like, I don't know, I feel like as, uh, you know, someone who at times is, like, hyper-fixated on uh, my body, that it is, like, I, I don't know what it's like to, like, not feel... <laughs> <laughs> not feel any any interest or any like uh emotion towards it and that that must be mm -hmm. you know that must be kind of nice and it also makes me think of there's another poem um where he he mentions a time i think like um i don't know if it specifically says something about the body but it's about eating when he's in college, mm -hmm. and they just like, just like, I have like mm -hmm. one M&M today, and that was perfectly <laughs> fine because that's all that I need because I don't care about my body, or at least that's that's what I that's what I got from the poem. I know that's not exactly what it says, but mm -hmm. um, it also made me think about that. I also did um, keep in mind that in the foreword, it explicitly calls out this poem uh, as well as well as a couple others about, mm -hmm. um, you know, like Yin Yi's trans experience and um, like attitude towards um, towards his body in general. Uh, so I did, I did have that in mind when I, when I was reading through this one. Um, so that I don't know, maybe a little bit of someone telling me what to think on this one, but I'm not, I'm not going to complain about that. Um, mm -hmm. it, did, it did help a little bit. I guess now that she mentioned the poem about uh, Yin Yi in college with the whole lunch thing, that's poem 27. I believe it's right after the, no, it's a different poem, but poem 27. Um, the author essentially mentions that, this is prior to his transition, that he felt like young girls bond over eating disorders. Um, because they all sort of do it um, in some way, shape, or form. Did that stick out to you in that poem? Um, it, I mean, it definitely read, read as eating disorder. I don't, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm seeing how so many other girls do this every day. Um, but I, I definitely see it as like a, I, I also would sometimes think maybe a little bit of a queer bonding thing at times too, mm -hmm. or at least in some of. Um, I know some some of the situations that that I'm aware of are like my own my own experiences, but um, no, it is it is like an interesting interesting piece to to add in there. I also um, you know again as a cis person, I don't necessarily have like a lot a lot of uh, thoughts on this, but I did I, I do find it interesting when he refers to, you know, his his life pre-transition and like, you know, like even like some quotes like I, I was a girl at the time. Um, and there are like a lot of a lot of mentions about womanhood. I think there's actually one where it mentions that like wom womanhood is like a country I come from, right? Where, where I go back mm -hmm. to I'm not, you know, not I'm not separated from it. I'm still, you know, I'm I'm still there whether or not I want to be. Um, just kind of 
you know, a little interesting, interesting take for me to absorb. Yeah, that poem stood to me as well. I think that poem was interesting to me because, well, I'm not trans, of course, um, and I guess I can't really. I'm not trying to say this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I have noticed that with a lot of trans men, uh, the it seems as if the impulse is to become hyper masculine. And I think that Yingyi is doing a very interesting thing where he's saying that that's not his intention at all. He never wants to step away from womanhood. Um, he just wants to, I guess, change the way he lives in it. Um, yeah, that was interesting to me. Um, in poem eight, something sticks out to me where the author says his friend Catherine is starting a podcast where she meets other Catherines. And oh. Yin Yi then goes into talk about how having a unique name has contributed to sort of his self worth or his perception of himself. Mm -hmm. uh, since you and I both have common names, Michael and Jonathan, I'm curious do you ever have any sort of feelings when you meet other Michaels? Um, or or does having a common name contribute to your perception of yourself? Um, I don't. I actually am named after my father. Um, mm -hmm. Every every man in my family on both sides, almost all of them, um, are named after <laughs> after essentially their their fathers. There are a lot of like a lot of duplicates. Um, so I don't. I don't know. But I do. Like you know, I've been told by my parents that I have like a really like a I, I won't say unique, but like a, a a name that was like my grandmother's maiden names picked out, and that uh, my parents couldn't decide. So at the last minute, they just like wrote wrote my dad's name down again after <laughs> how, however many days it had been, and they like had not put a thing on there. But I do like especially with the idea of like a a name like that. Um, I I don't know, like I don't really I I meet a lot of other Michaels and mm -hmm. they're all. See, see a lot, a lot of different people when you have a, uh, you know, pretty, a pretty common name like that. Like I know, I know Michael's of every, every ethnicity, age, whatever. But um, I'm sure that the same, it's not the same if you have a more. Uh, I don't, I don't want to say unique name. Um, it feels like a very, like not, not appropriate way to say that. Um, <laughs> If you, if you if you just have a less a less common name that um i don't know maybe maybe it's easier to see see more of your more of yourself reflected especially a name like yinyam which i'm assuming while we we know here has like some some like cultural roots that you're gonna you know ideally see some other other person with some similar background but mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, what do you? I, I, yeah, as as a Jonathan, what are your what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, for me, it's similar. I mean, I don't know if as a Michael you experience the same thing, but I for me, I've experienced there's different ways to spell Jonathan, and I think obviously my name is one of the more common. I have an H in my name, so that's how most people spell it, but. I think I definitely have a certain bias when I meet Jonathans that have an H and that don't. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I think I have a, a certain bias as opposed to people who call themselves Jonathan, John, or Johnny. I know for me, I, I have a very strict rule, like, don't ever call me John or Johnny. I hate that. Yeah. Um, like, like, <laughs> and, like, I do not like, like Mike. I don't like Mikey. <laughs> no. And it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, I have like an ex of mine from several years ago who also was named Jonathan with an H. And he says that he's noticed that gay people were very strict. Our name has to be the full name. Like we hate yeah. being called those nicknames. <laughs> and I think that's true. I think whenever I meet Johns or Johnnies, they're always straight <laughs> and Jonathan's are always gay. I didn't think about that, but now the more... <laughs> also, it's funny you mentioned that my, my very first boyfriend was uh, also named Michael. Very, uh, <laughs> very fun little experience to meet someone with the same name. Yeah, calling out your own name in bed is always awkward. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I would say that it having a common name contributes to my self-worth. I think maybe I feel like I fit in. 
uh, in a lot of spaces where I can imagine with uh, a name as cultural as Yin Yi in American culture, you probably don't feel that way, uh, which is what I think that Yin Yi is trying to get at um, in this poem as well. Um, and I guess I'm curious, since his name is cultural, does he feel the same way when he's around people who are also Chinese? Or is this only a feeling he feels when he's around people who are American? Um, I don't know because I don't believe the author mentions it ever, but that would be a, a question of mine. Um, yeah. I did have another another thought on the Kate's thing. Mm -hmm. um, just because it, it comes up several times, there are several poems about the... Mm -hmm about Kate and all the Kates. Um, and a couple times it made me just, it made me think, uh, trying to imagine that it's not necessarily about like someone, someone named Kate, but maybe it's about like, uh, you know, for a big part of the book, I thought maybe it's about, specifically about lesbians and mm -hmm. like Kate is trying to interview other lesbians or like meet other lesbians, talk to other lesbians. Um, and then I sort of like broadened that, I think, towards the end and thought maybe it's just about queer people in general. But did you get any any sense of anything like that when you read all of the Kate poems? I did not think of that until you mentioned it. But now that I do, now that I, I am thinking about that, I think you're right. I mean, perhaps the uh, the finding people with similar names to you theme really ties into just wanting a sense of community. I mean, I think that even the Kate poem does mention that pretty clearly that this Catherine wants to feel community with other Kates um, and kind of find herself in them. Um, and I guess, I guess again, not to go back to the name thing, but to be someone with a different name or perhaps a different cultural background or uh, gender expression, you search for that same community, but it's harder for you to find because you're not as common, so to speak. Um, and I think that definitely can be a queer experience if you're around people who are not queer. Um, or in this, in Yin Yi's case, even a cultural experience. I mean, it seems like he spends a lot of his time with people who are not Chinese or are not even uh, immigrants. So I'm sure that a lot of his experiences, he's felt, I guess, a bit of an outsider. And there's even a poem where he mentions that uh, to be a quote unquote foreigner is to always feel like a guest um, in someone's house. It's to never have manners. It's to never understand certain societal norms. Um, oh, actually, it's funny you say that. I think that is the one. That's the poem right after this one. Is it? Um, yes, it is. with the Cheerios. Yeah, Cheerios. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I had, I really had a similar, a very similar note that like, is this poem really about the queer or POC experience having to prove yourself over and over again, uh, sometimes daily, depending on the setting? Mm -hmm. Or I think it also could be, uh, this poem in particular can speak to the fact that like, when you're someone that doesn't have the same cultural understanding as other people, um, a lot of your attempts to be kind or to build friendships can come off quite weird. And I think for people who, if you're with someone who's ignorant, they don't even attempt to understand what you're trying to do. They just judge you. I mean, it seems like this girl, what's her name, Julie? June, June. Um, it seems like the Cheerios as a birthday favor kind of ruined their friendship, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, she did not take it as Yin Yi trying to be kind. Um, yeah. But it could tie into a queer experience. Yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah. I actually, I I was thinking about the one before before the Cheerios. Oh. Between between um, Cheerios and Kate, do you have one that says, like, we didn't have cable? Yeah, we'd have cable. Yeah, yeah. But, but sort of That's similar, nice. I mean, it really does, it ties into the... To, it is the exact same thing as you know what you what you just mentioned that like sometimes sometimes you're not sure of like how how other people are 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 connecting and that it gets taken um, you know in a little bit of a strange way sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I guess while we're on the Cheerios poem, I think it also relates to like class difference. It seems like for Yin Yi, 
the ability to have Cheerios for breakfast each morning is a privilege because he says they're quite expensive. Um, and they come in their own box as opposed to going to a store where you have to like, you know, get them out. Um, well, they're out of box. But it seems like for June, having Cheerios are is quite normal. Um, and I guess just that difference as well, having the, I guess, the rich friend and the poor friend. Um, did that stick out to you, that class difference there? Um, it did. Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, sorry, I completely lost my train of thought. No, that's okay. <laughs> can you can you repeat <laughs> what you were saying? Yeah, um, I was saying how in uh, the Cheerios poem, which is poem ten, um, there is I, I think uh, I think Yin Yi is alluding to a class difference. Um, how for June having Cheerios for breakfast is a norm. But for Yin Yi, having such an expensive brand name cereal is actually a privilege. Um, and I was curious if you noticed that class difference as well. And how, I guess, to further the point, Yin Yi giving June cereal, Cheerios, as a party favor is a big deal for them. But for June, it's just like you're giving me something I, I always have anyway. Yeah. Um, that, that did come across. And thank you. Sorry, I just... I. No, it's okay. uh, my, my, mildly distracted and like completely completely blanked um, is not <laughs> not very much like me. Um, <laughs> but no, it do, it does it does feel like that, um, especially with like the line line at the end of like you know, like being being made to feel poor that I had nothing to give, and I don't know that's necessarily nothing to give, but like exactly what you mentioned that it's not it's not nothing, but when it's something that you already have whenever you want, like does it it doesn't have any value. Mm -hmm. I guess that age old parent adage about like taking things for granted. Yeah. Because everyone doesn't always have them. Um, yeah. In poem 16, I guess to skip around just a little bit. Um, the author mentioned something interesting. They talk about how, uh, how putting, I, putting, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I think my numbers are like one or two off. On a lot of okay. Them. What what are the first three words of your sixteen? Let me see. That is. Here's what it's like if it's hard okay. to put yourself first. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That way, okay. not not like ta talking about a completely different <laughs> poem, wondering why. <laughs> like, wow, what an interesting interpretation John is having. <laughs> <laughs> um. I saying uh, the author talks about how putting others first can seem selfless but at least in their case it's coming from a totally selfish place um putting others first is actually his way of getting people to love him uh for me that poem really harped on like people pleasing and like how people pleasers and i guess coming from a previous people pleaser myself um it seems it seems almost as if you're making a lot of friends because you're making people happy, but in actuality, you're not letting people know you because you're not being honest about your desires. Um, so you don't really have any friends. Um, I'm curious if that stick out to you, the the aspect of like people pleasing. And I also noticed that theme in a few other poems as well, especially when we talk about relationships. It did, and I, um, it did sort of make me think of this thing of like, yeah, yes, like it is nice to like be relieved and see other people around you happy, but it doesn't matter if you're never happy about it. Mm -hmm. um, and also it made me think a little bit of this in an experience I had earlier this week where I was, I was, in a, I was at an event and there was a, like a, a group of probably a little bit younger um, women than like my age. And they were, we were talking about this one friend that didn't come and they were like you know she like never really wants to like be around and i just went to her I'm like just the more the more they talked i was like i don't think she wants to be your friend it doesn't feel like you're happy being her friend or she's happy being your friend yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's like she's just like doing stuff to make you guys happy and you don't really care about her but i just i 
you know, kept my mouth shut and minded my business because I was, <laughs> but um, I just, I heard like a very, a very long detailed conversation and it made, it made me think back to um, some, some of these poems that I, that I've read the day before, um, which is kind of funny, but this one in particular also, there is one where um, he mentions that like, um, I, I, on page 58 in my book, which means it's somewhere between poem 56 and 60. Um, when, when I love someone, I finally understood I was worthy of love. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, this, this poem in particular, I, you know, thought, thought of this one at the same time. Um, especially because like, there's this mention in this particular poem, like I want another person to be able to love me. Uh, and then we, we see that a little bit. I just, my note on the second one is just a, a smiley face with a tear. That's all I want to make this <laughs> there. Um, yeah, was that, that, go ahead. No, go ahead. I wouldn't say, was that one of the ones that you were, you were referencing when you, you mentioned seeing, seeing this sort of theme in a couple of different places? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, I think even in that same poem, there's a line where he says, um, gosh, I have it written down here. Uh, he says that, uh, I thought love was a trapdoor out of loneliness. It isn't. Um, it is so unnatural to me that, to believe that I, that what I can't control will be kind to me. Um, yeah, I think again, people pleasing. This idea that, I guess, through love, you will find the ability to love yourself, which I know that's a very common, like, very common idea that I see people uh, mention a lot is like, you learn to love yourself by someone else loving you, which to me never really makes much sense. Um, I guess I err more on the side of if you can't love yourself, no one else can love you. Um, Likewise. Yeah, you agree with that too. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's my little RuPaul reference, but yeah. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, again, that same people pleasing uh, theme. Which I mean, I'm curious towards the end, I don't really see that Yin Yi found the ability to break that cycle um, of people pleasing or putting others first. Um, did you notice that? I feel like towards the end, he still has that same issue. Um, it does feel a little bit like it still exists. And as we, as we talk more about it, I wonder if you think any part of that is, um, cultural or part of like an immigrant mindset, mm. um, of, of just having to like always, I, I don't want to say like be, be in service, but that is how, I mean, a lot, a lot of immigrant folks find, find success is by like working, working in what are essentially service industries, even if you, you know, own, own, own a restaurant, that's still, still a service industry. If you own a laundromat, that's still, still a service industry, you own a gas station. Um, it's still, still all sort of like this idea of, of always, always being in service to, to the other, to the like, I don't say like white American, but uh, it does make me think about that a little bit. I don't, I don't feel like that is like resolved or overcome uh, as we as we go through the book. I think it's still it still exists from you know what what we have, what we see uh, through you know, pretty pretty much like to the end of it. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I guess to be fair, I mean, uh, have to understand the book was only written in a year. I think that something as a cycle as difficult to break as people pleasing can't be broken in just a year um i think that takes like several years of therapy to understand why that's so wrong and damaging to your relationships uh, so i guess uh <laughs> give you a break i guess <laughs> um There's another poem where uh, I can't remember what page it's on or which poem it is for that matter, but it's the one where he talks about having to break up his parents fighting all the time. Do you remember that? Poem? I don't. 
I feel like it was. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't remember where it was or too too much about it. It sounds like something I would have read towards the beginning. Um. Do you think that that informs like other other parts of the book, or why 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 does that one stick out to you? Yeah, I, I think it does inform other parts. There's a line in that poem where Yin Yi says that um, when you're in a, when you're in a relationship, you your body and your partner's body become one. So when your partner is abusing you physically or emotionally, they're actually abusing themselves. And if you love that person, essentially you kind of let them uh, let them abuse you until they can, I guess, work it out. And I was curious what your thoughts were on that. Because I think that also ties into the poem where Yin Yi talks about being abused by a, a partner. Um, did you have any thoughts on that line? I know you said the poem didn't stick out to you, so I'm not sure if that line did or not. Um, I just, I found it again. I'm re rereading it. Um, Do you mind repeating your question since I was reading the poem while you were talking? <laughs> yeah, um, sure. Um, I'm curious if you had any thoughts on the line where Yin Yi says, um, if I could find the poem, I'd say the exact line, but essentially it is saying that um, one of you in the relationship has to kind of let the other one walk all over you. Um, I was curious if you had any thoughts on that line. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I do know. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. I do have thoughts. Um, I'm trying trying to gather them and speak from like a uh, outside perspective and uh, maybe some, some level of personal experience. But um, I I don't know how I feel about like saying that someone has to like let that happen because it can be like so so many complex things that are that are part of that. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, saying saying something like that does does make it stick out. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you thinking back to to include the other poem where Yin Yi seems to be like on the uh, the abused side of a relationship? Um, or was it? Well, I don't even, I remember it, so I don't even see it. Um, it. It makes me think, like, what what does he think about himself, like, looking looking back towards those situations? Um, and or, or, like, what does he think of the relationship between his parents? And I know that there are quite a few, what seem to be quite a few poems about uh, about about his mother in here. Mm -hmm. um, she gets she gets a lot of attention for for someone that uh, I don't know. It seems seems like he's saying was like letting letting that happen, but mm -hmm. um, maybe maybe that's like repeating or did repeat at some point with him as well. Mm -hmm. You know, why? Why uh, why did that question come to mind for you? I think for me that just made me think of like martyrdom. And I think that in Yin Yi's mind or possibly in the mind of other abuse victims, I don't want to generalize, but uh, possibly in their minds as well, this idea that you have to essentially, uh, I don't want to use the term punching bag, but you have to allow yourself to... Uh, you have to sacrifice yourself for your partner's needs. Um, and that, in their mind, can seem like a a form of love, but at the same time, you're sacrificing, you're not loving yourself in that because you're letting someone else abuse you. Um, and I thought it was interesting that that was Yin Yi's takeaway, or at least what I believe to be their takeaway from that, as opposed to learning how wrong that is. Um, 
And also now that you mentioned the several poems in which Yin Yi's mother is uh, mentioned, I noticed there's very few where, I don't think there's any actually, where Yin Yi mentions his father directly um, outside of the poem either. with his mother. Um, yeah, did, you didn't say that either, did you? No, I don't think so. Yeah, I think it's just the mother. And I was curious, like, is his father passed away? Is that why he doesn't speak about him much? Or does he just mainly communicate with his mother? Um, that, for me, is kind of left out of the book, I think. Yeah. It does, it does make me curious, because I don't think I really, like, I obviously caught how much there was about the mother, but... Because mm -hmm. um, it, it does explicitly say parents, like, mm -hmm. plural, in quite a few places. Mm -hmm. But... Um, yeah, it doesn't like specifically reference the father. I don't think at all. Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, and I guess I'm also curious, like, what did the father think of Yin Yi's coming out? Um, because we obviously get the mother's thoughts on it, but not the father's. Maybe the father doesn't even know. Or doesn't care. Yeah, perhaps doesn't care. Or doesn't want to acknowledge it, which is yeah. another thing I think that a lot of parents uh, go through as well. Um, hmm. And I guess, I know we mentioned it way earlier, but with the shoe poem, uh, <laughs> and he mentions that the shoes look very gay. And, and then I guess once he wore the shoes is when his mother actually believed that he was a lesbian, or that he was, I guess at the time he was not trans, at that time was a lesbian. Um, and that made me think of how like physical apparel can be a signifier of queerness. Uh, and I'm curious, like, did you ever, at any point, whether now or prior in your life, when it comes to clothing, did you ever think of like clothing as being too gay or like making you look too gay or? Um, <laughs> y yes, uh, <laughs> I, I, I didn't really like come out until, um, until I went to college, but, mm -hmm. um, definitely, I don't, I don't want to say like gated up, but wore, wore, <laughs> wore like, wore a lot of things that I, I wouldn't wear now. And I think maybe it was just like swinging from, you know, really, really sheltered, uh, like closeted version of myself to like having you know, having as much freedom as I wanted and sort of like taking that a little, a little far sometimes when trying to, mm. again, also like young adult, like trying to, you know, find, find yourself hone in on like how you, how you express yourself. Um, but no, I, def I definitely do think there, you know, sometimes clothes, clothes can be a little bit of a dead giveaway. Uh, mm -hmm. I think less and less sometimes, which again, like another like funny, funny experience in my own life that I was like at lunch yesterday with friend and <laughs> there were um two guys sitting in the restaurant and we could not tell if they if they are on <laughs> a date or not and the one guy had he had his fingernails painted gold and th then he did something when he left that i was like oh that's like the straightest thing that you could do i don't think i i don't <laughs> think they were like on a date i don't <laughs> i don't know <laughs> um that i will say it can be sometimes i think less and less um, de depending on where you live, I also I live in a big city, but I live I live in an urban area. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that also has a difference, uh, makes a difference. Um, I don't think I would see any straight men with gold fingernails in, uh, you know, in like the backwoods of some mm -hmm. rural state, like where I grew up. But uh, that it can be, it definitely can can be like a. Uh, I don't I don't, don't want to say a tell, but maybe a, a chosen way to to express your queerness at times mm. and i know that i a lot of times start talking and don't actually answer your questions and start talking about something else um that's so okay. I'm, not, I'm not done that this time but <laughs> that's okay <laughs> I, I think like you i i agree i mean i guess i've always kind of been out in a way i mean i've always been at least mildly feminine so I don't think I have really had to officially come out to anyone, people assumed. Um, yeah. But yeah, I do believe that clothes are a signifier. I mean, even in high school while I was I was out, um, I was very mindful of the way that I chose to dress. I mean, prior to like 
graduating high school, I don't think I ever wore shorts. Um, I always thought shorts were like too gay or like too feminine. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea of like having to wear shorts kind of made me uncomfortable. Like, I don't want people to know that I'm gay or, you know, but once I got to college, I mean, my whole wardrobe was shorts and the shorter, the better. Um, I think a lot of that, I guess, came from like getting away from my parents and like being on my own for the first time. And like, also at that point, I was very much like, I wanted to have sex. So that's why I was dressing that way, I guess. Yeah. But like, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, I do think that uh, clothing can be a big signifier. But to your point about the painted nails, I do think that that has changed in more recent years. I mean, I'm noticing a lot more men, whether they be gay, straight, bisexual, whatever, that uh, they're painting their nails. I know there was a big trend for a while with like straight men wearing necklaces and jewelry and pearls and. Um, so I think in more recent years that is changing, um, but I do believe that like maybe five years prior and on that any sort of like painted nails or jewelry, whatever, was like a big signifier that someone is gay. Um, and I guess it's becoming harder to tell, which is a good thing and a bad thing, I guess, uh, for some people. Hmm. And I think that's it for my notes i mean i hate to be so short i just feel like a lot of the poems didn't stick out to me too much um if you have well, any others of course we can keep going i feel the same way i did i did just have a question um because yeah. i i always want to place significance on on any of these collections on what what is first and what is last um mm -hmm. uh, do you do you remember the last poem let me go back over because i don't remember it, i don't think Um, it's on page 73 in my book, which means it's probably like 64 in yours. Um, I also have quite a few blank pages, but they, yeah. the numbers continue as if the blank pages had numbers. On my end, it says that the pages were intentionally left blank. Um, okay. Now that I'm going over the last poem, starts of all the things I have done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when I read it, it confused me as well. Um, I don't think I fully understand. I was right. Maybe I kind of do. I was raised to kill this place, the impulse. The, I was raised to kill this, the impulse to build and protect a place where you and I can live as ourselves. Um, I guess that's speaking to like being raised to be, I guess to be homophobic would be the phrase. Um, hmm. I don't know, as, as I read it, I was just, I was trying to place it and think like, is this, is this directed towards towards like one person, towards a romantic interest? Is it directed towards maybe like towards all queer people? Is it directed towards his mother? And I couldn't like decide between the three and it made it made sense in all three contexts to me at least. Um, I guess I'm 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 curious if you if you have any thoughts on who's like on the receiving end of of this one. That's an interesting point because I'm not sure myself. There are definitely some lines to me that make it seem like a romantic interest, but some that make it seem like it could be his mother. Uh, like, for example, the line where he says, I am proud to trust you despite the pain. Um, I think that could possibly be his mother um, because he continues to trust and I guess honor his mother in a way after all the pain she's inflicted on him. But that could also be the after effects of being in an abusive home. Um, how even through your abuse, you still try and love people. Um, you're right. In every context, whether it be mother or partner, it makes sense. Um, yeah. I, I tried to think yeah. it about like like queer community, too. And with, with that line in particular, um, I don't know if maybe there there was something there about uh may, maybe like his his trans experience or i don't know i just i wanted it to be i wanted it to be more more than just one person like as a 
feel like a, a big like closing note, but maybe maybe it's not. Maybe I'm trying to ascribe, uh, you know, a lot a lot more than what is there. Hmm. Yeah, definitely leads a lot, I guess, to be desired. Um, I wish I had a direct answer to your question, but I don't. I think I'm just as confused as you are, <laughs> unfortunately. I, I guess to your question, I don't know if I see a, a direct reason as to why this poem is the last and the dream diary is the first. Um, I will say that the last poem seems to be like in Yi's future with whoever he's talking about. Um, which makes sense for a an ending to a book, but was there any reason to you that stuck out that made either one of them first and last? Um, I, I wasn't sure about last. Um, I, I kind of think when I read the first line, like of all the things I've done, like maybe, you know, like of, of everything in this book, like I'm, you know, here's what I'm most proud of, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not too sure. Yeah. It was it was a nice a nice one to end on. Mm -hmm. I agree. I guess I'm a little bit curious. The the last line, not out of necessity but abundance. That I don't understand at all. Do you get that? <laughs> um, <laughs> there's always something that something's happening that will change the moments for me. I. I think when I read it with the line before, with the part about sharing with each other, mm -hmm. um, they're they're sharing sharing themselves not not because they have to, but because there's just so I I want to hopefully say so so much joy, um, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's a little that that one is throwing me a little bit too. Now that I look back at it. I guess that's a good that's a good way to interpret it. Abundance, abundance of joy to share, life to share, experiences to share. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Interpretation. Yeah. Hmm. Were there any other poems that stuck out to you? Any other questions you have? Themes you want to go over? Um, I don't think so. I think we hit on all of the all all of the big ones that I like. I had notes on or was was really excited to hear um mm -hmm. hear, hear your thoughts or interpretations yeah same here i mean i think a lot of our thoughts and interpretations kind of mirror each other um i think we're both a little bit confused <laughs> so <laughs> um now that we've i guess uh i guess we're done with this book now i'm curious how do you feel about reading poetry in the club in the um future? I, I enjoy it. I do. Uh, it it's not as straightforward, so I think it takes a lot more a lot more time with the material. Like I originally, when I read this, I think I read it in like forty minutes. Actually, I read it when I was getting a tattoo done, uh, which was like a nice a nice distraction. Uh, but. Uh, then like as as I went back and reread it, I'm like, I, I really just like like it's not it's not a lot of text to read, but it needed mm -hmm. a lot a lot more time to like sort of sort of think and connect and try and understand uh in a in a way that I think in like in, in a book is you know really really laid out for you. You're like this this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Um which mm -hmm. we're we're not getting with the poems, but I like I like trying to trying to piece it together, understand or or uh, you know, like pick up on on common themes. Mm. But how how did you feel about the uh, the poems? And I will just say in general that I I really do appreciate that we've done like some very very different things like short stories, poems, longer mm -hmm. stories um, makes makes things a lot more a lot more interesting and keeps me keeps me a little bit more more challenged and engaged. So. <laughs> yeah. I agree. I, I do enjoy the fact that we've covered so many different uh, so many different genres. I mean, honestly, if I was left to my own devices, I would pretty much just read like everyday fiction. Um, so I like having a group where we all kind of have different interests. Um, and I think you are the one who kind of 
who kind of made me think of poetry. I haven't read poetry in over 10 years and I probably wouldn't uh, had it not been for this, this month's assignments. Um, so I'm very glad I got a chance to read something new that I wouldn't usually read. Um, and yeah, I think I, I enjoy reading poetry. I think I really also enjoy the fact that we read two in one month. Um, well, I'm not, I'm not a big person, I'm not a big fan of uh, comparing books because I think obviously each author's experience, writing ability, whatever is different. But I think that with two books in the same genre, uh, it's kind of interesting to draw comparisons between the two. Um, and yeah, I would definitely be willing to read poetry in the future. Um, I guess my second question to that is, what are your thoughts on four shorter books like this, poetry, short story collections, whatever? Uh, what is your thought on having two meetings in the same month? Uh, I actually liked having the two meetings. Um, I also, I, I also just personally really, really enjoy this, uh, and mm -hmm. and and choose to like make make the time for it. So, I, I was excited about two meetings. Um, I know, I know that for for other people that may not be easier, but I didn't, I didn't mind it. We still had a lot to talk about, even though they were shorter books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you said that because. I really like having two meetings a month. I mean, of course, I don't think it's feasible every month, especially when we have longer books. I don't want to overwhelm anyone with assigning two books and then each book is like 800 pages. Um, but yeah, for shorter stories, I think it works really well. Um, also, yeah, I really enjoy these two. I actually find myself looking forward to them and like missing them. Um, like for example, my week was kind of dull. So I like kept looking forward to this Sunday um, and then I've been like up all day, like looking forward to 12 p.m. So I'm glad you feel the same way. <laughs> um, which leads me to my selection for next month. I know we talked at the end of last month about the idea of having a horror story. Um, I have one. I will just say that. I'll send you the description, of course, like always, but I will say that the book's description doesn't necessarily make it seem like a queer story, but I've been assured like several times it very much is. Um, so I guess just keep that in mind when you read the description. Um, and I'll send that now. It's called uh, Monstrilio by Gerardo Samano uh, Cordova. My pronunciation is horrible, so I'm sorry if you speak Spanish. <laughs> um, I'm not. I people speak Spanish to me all the time because I um, have the the complexion and outward appearance of uh, <laughs> a Latino or Hispanic person, but I have uh, no no Spanish speaking roots. <laughs> I do all lingo, but that is that is about it. <laughs> That's very good rating. Mm -hmm. And like people are loving it, so I'm curious uh, if it'll be good. I did read the first chapter. I will just say that uh, it does get pretty gory. Um, at least the first chapter does. So I'm not sure where you land on gore, but just keep that in mind. Um, um, I don't mind that. OK, cool. Also, I, I really, really, really enjoy horror books. Um, mm -hmm. so. Me too. Yeah. Yep. I'm fine with this one. OK, cool, cool, cool. Um, and like always, last Sunday of each month work for you? Uh, yes. Which would be the 28th, April 28th. OK. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, same time, 12 PM for me. And then, you know, your 3 time. 3 PM difference. for me, yes. OK, sounds good. OK, before we go, any other comments, questions about anything, the book, club, whatever? Um, I don't have any. I do feel tricked. I thought you were going to say we're going to have two meetings next month, but. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was thinking about it. But then no, I was thinking... I'm just, I'm just teasing. <laughs> yeah. OK, cool. <laughs> and I was like, I do want to make sure I finish the book. I don't want to give myself too much to. Yeah. But yeah, more than the, I can with, chew. With, with the poetry, definitely. Definitely, too. Again, like 45 minutes for me to read it the first time. Like, I'm not. Mm. That's fine, but like, I will. This this one looks like I don't know how many pages it is. I think it's around three forty. Yeah, three forty. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that's hours and hours of reading. Um, so <laughs> for for me at least. Okay. 
Well, here we go. Thank you for coming, um, as always. And I will see you on the 28th of April at 12 p.m. 3 p.m. Yep. for you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, as always. Mm -hmm. I always enjoy these. So. <laughs> Me too. Bye-bye, Michael. Bye, Jonathan.